Okay. Thanks. So uh, I'm Jesse, and probably some of the, the previous talks you might have heard were more focused on the, the kernel portion of Op OpenV Switch. Uh, but today I'm actually going to talk about something a little bit different, which is a, a project that I've been working on for the past couple of years, and that's the Genev encapsulation protocol. And the reason why I think it's interesting, because as you heard in the last talk, OVN has started using Genev as its encapsulation format that's using by default between hypervisors. And usually this pretty much immediately prompts a question, maybe what is Genev? Or at the very least, why are you using Genev as opposed to something like VXLAN? You know, I think probably most people have heard about VXLAN at this point in time. And you know, it's pretty well established. There's a number of implementations out there. So you know, th people always want to know, why wouldn't you just use what's out there? And even if you have something that's a little bit better, you know, why go through the pain of trying to switch? So hopefully I'm going to try to answer both of those questions today, and then also talk even more about some interesting things about what we can do in the future, um, and not just what we're doing today. So the first thing is just, you know, why not use something that's out there? So there's a number of existing protocols. We have VXLAN, we have MVGRE, we have STT, and these have all been deployed in some way or form in different types of uh, production environments. And they're basically what I would consider to be the, the first generation set of encapsulation protocols. And they, they all have some different pros and cons to, uh, against each other. But at the end of the day, they tend to have some pretty similar characteristics when it comes to some of the limitations that we might want to improve upon for a second generation. So the first one that's been around for quite a long time is that VXLAN actually kind of linked the control plane with the data plane. So if you think about the, the first version of VXLAN, it specified that the multicast control plane should be used and you do flooding and learning in order to discover other endpoints and, and set up some of your tables. And people realized fairly quickly that maybe this wasn't exactly the best type of thing to do. And so they started to decouple the two. So you would have a, a control plane that might do whatever new things that people wanted, and then you'd have a data plane using the existing VXLine frame format um, that you know, people have already started implementing in different devices. And this actually turned out to be a pretty good idea. But I would actually say that we should go a step further and make this kind of an explicit requirement that we really want to keep these two concerns separate. And they're not things that should overlap with each other or, or impinge upon the other's ability to keep on doing new things. Now, obviously, this isn't something that requires a new encapsulation format. We've already worked around this in, in large part. But I, I think it's important enough that I want to call it out as something that's important for any new encapsulation format. I should take that as a core principle. The more interesting part is actually around extensibility. So if you look at the, the amount of metadata, which is the important part of, of extensibility, that you have in, in VXLAN, that's really just the 24-bit VNI. In NVGRE, it's a 24-bit, again, TNI. And with STT, the situation's a little bit better, but you have 64 bits, and that's fundamentally just as limited um, and, and fixed as 24 bits is. Now, you might ask yourself, so what? You know, why do I care if I don't have more space than that? You can do some basic things. But the reality is, is that metadata is really the, the lifeblood of a network virtualization solution. If you th think about where a 24-bit VNI came from, it's really just a VLAN tag, or, or rather two VLAN tags that have been stacked upon each other. And the, the, the goal of that is mostly just for partitioning of the network. And that's an important thing to do, but that's not all network virtualization is. If, if I want to build up a real network virtualization solution, I, I want to be rich. I, I want to be able to have services that I had in my underlay, and, and I, I want them to provide security. I want them to provide telemetry, all kinds of things that are, is now my overlay. And I, I want it to work very smoothly. And each one of these additional services requires some additional space. And, and so the more things that the more space you have, the more things you can do, and I don't want to be limited um, by just encapsulation protocol. So I, mean, I think probably most of us agree that you know, it could be useful to have more space, but you know, what are some actual concrete examples of this? So you know, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One of them is something as simple as a checksum. So if you look at other protocols, you know, Ethernet, IP, TCP, all of these each have a checksum associated with the respective layer. But VXLAN does not. And you know, th there's a little bit of information that's important there today. 
But there's probably going to be even more if you buy into this philosophy that we need more metadata. And so you think, OK, sure, I, I could add a checksum. I can kind of wedge it into some of the reserve space in the VXLAN header. But first of all, that, that tends, up, tends to use a fair amount of your space already, just for something very simple. But it also is a little bit inelegant, and you have to kind of figure out where you can put the bits, and it's, it's not really what you would naturally do. So perhaps the thing you could do is you define an extra extension to VXLAN that has a checksum, but then you've kind of broken the, the original principle that you were trying to hold, which was to not change the existing protocol. If you take that a step further, um, you know, a checksum is rather basic, but maybe you want to have authentication or encryption. You know, I think people have been starting to go down this path for a while, but certainly with all of the, the recent disclosures from the NSA, there's a lot more interest in, in encryption even within the data center. And you can kind of think of encryption or authentication almost like a checksum, but of course quite a bit stronger uh, and with additional security properties. So if you want to do encryption, then you need to step and, and think again where you're going to put that. And you know, that, that might be in the IP header, but that, that has some trade-offs. You know, another place that you might put it is in the tunnel header, uh, but of course now you need even more space than before. So, so each one of these things that you do, you know, it seems like a, a little bit of incremental step, but you just need a little bit more space and a little bit more space, and uh, it, it quickly starts to add up. Th there's a few others that come to mind. I, I'm actually going to talk about them a little bit later, so I'll, I'll just quickly go, go over them. But certainly, you know, other security policies, ACLs, um, you know, the hypervisor is often a very privileged place to get information. So you might want to extract some information from the, the VM that's running and, and use that to write security policies, but you need to put that in the tunnel header. Um, and you also might want to do some kind of OAM to find out information about your underlay network um, or do other control or troubleshooting practice. All of this requires additional information. And of course, th these are the things that you know, we can imagine today that come to mind. You know, I I'm sure that there's going to be other things in the future. I certainly hope that this will continue to evolve. And you know, I think that's great. You know, I don't want to have to limit anybody from doing those in the future. And I don't also want to have to keep on introducing new encapsulation formats in, in order to, to support each one of those. So, so that's kind of where the existing problem came from and what we were trying to solve. But of course, that's just a, you know, a problem. It's not actually a solution. So a while back, uh, a number of us got together. And it turns out that a lot of people were actually running into essentially the same problems, you know, this, this problem of extensibility. So you know, VMware was looking at issues with extensibility in VXLAN. It turns out that Microsoft was actually having almost the exact same problem within VGRE. So some of us got together, and we started working on it and tried to see if we could find a, a solution to this problem that would actually solve this for, for everyone. And so a, a number of, of people came from actually different parts of the networking industry. So you have uh, you know, kind of the, the software guys, the hypervisor side of things. You, you have the, the guys that make the actual chips that, that go in networking equipment. And, and then you also have the, the people that make you know, finished boxes that they would package up and, and sell to you to put on your network. So all of us started to, to think about a solution to this problem. And that ultimately resulted in a, a draft spec that was published on Valentine's Day uh, of all days, uh, which of course prompted uh, you know, quite a few jokes about you know, group hugs and, and that kind of thing. So the thing that was published, of course, is what I, I started talking about before, the, the Genev draft. And th the goal was to, to solve exactly the problem that I, I was describing. So we wanted something that took the best principles of what was out there already, um, and combined it with some additional extensibility and not really try to reinvent the wheel. Um, so you know, we want to keep it pretty simple and not try to keep on guessing about what might come next or, or otherwise put you know, a lot of complicated speculation in. So of course, if it's a networking presentation involving a protocol, you need one of these dashes and pluses diagrams. So, th so this is kind of what came out at the end of the day. So we, we took the UDP header, which is essentially very similar to VXLAN, uh, which provides good transit capability over existing IP networks. We added a, a base uh, small fixed header, um, which, which takes some of the properties of protocols like GRE, which has a, a next protocol field that's, say, missing in VXLAN. 
And then at the end, we added uh, a set of TLVs, which are our type length value options. And th this is commonly used in a lot of different protocols uh, as the, the best way to add extensibility in, in a way that, that's nearly limitless in, in what it can do um, as far as future capabilities. So each one of these is essentially kind of an incremental step from what was there already. Um, again, the, the goal was not actually to try to revolutionize you know, protocol design or anything like that. The goal was really to keep it simple and, and something that is relatively clean and easy to use. And, and you might think that having a lot of flexibility makes it actually more complicated, but that's actually not necessarily true because if you're concerned about needing to add a bit here or be very parsimonious with a bit there, then you really have to guess about what is going to happen in the future. And really, nobody is good at that. It, it never works out. Um, so if you instead focus on having a very rich extensibility mechanism, you can be confident in, in what you have and, and not worry um, about what might come in the future until you actually know what the future is. And at that point, you can define uh, an extension that will support that once it is fully understood. And you can do it in a way that doesn't require revising an entire protocol and revising all of the ecosystem of hardware and software support. And, and so this is something that I, I think is really extremely powerful. So th that's all well and good, of course, to actually sit down and you, know, you can write a piece of paper. Um, but it doesn't really get you much unless you have implementations. And this is something that that people tend to worry a, a lot about. Um, you know, even if it's the, the best spec in the world, you know, at the very least, it, it's going to take a while before you have implementations that can start using it. And so you know, th that is definitely true, of course, in, in this case. But the fortunate thing is that we actually have been working on it for a couple of years at this point. And I think that we're actually in, in pretty good shape as far as the number of implementations out there. That's pretty much covering the spectrum of different possibilities for what you might need. So on the, the left-hand side, you have what are mostly software implementation. So OOVN, of course, was already mentioned as using it for encapsulation between hypervisors. And then the, the actual you know, encoding of, of that would happen through either OVS or, or, or Linux on the data plane side. And perhaps just as important is having you know, tools to debug when, you, when something might go wrong, such as you know, Wireshark or TCB dump. All of these tools that we normally would expect to use, all, all of that have support for Geneva right out of the box, so things just work. On the other hand, you have hardware implementations. And this is what people tend to get a little bit more worried about, just because it takes a bit of time in, in order for hardware to be developed and then deployed in, in the data center. And so here we have basically two categories. We have both the, the network card side, which you might install in a hypervisor or other type of server. And then you also have a switching ASIC that might show up in a top of rack switch. And in both of these sets of things, we have, uh, I would say, a pretty representative set of implementations uh, from, from various major manufacturers. And, and so I'm happy to feel, to say that, you know, I think we've kind of turned the corner as far as implementations. And it's something that you can reasonably expect to go out and use in the short term and have uh, good support. Of course, so, so all, all of these are, are you know, public. This isn't uh, you know, kind of any secret information. So you know, if you're interested in hearing more, then I would certainly encourage you to go and just uh, you know, look them up or, or talk to any vendors that you might currently work with. So that's, that's basically kind of the theory, right? That's, you know, that's why we developed the protocol, and that's you know, how it exists. But you know, how does it actually get used in practice? So, so you know, OVN has started using um, some Genev TLVs that it has defined. And these are basically used to stitch together the virtual network itself. And so I, I think that the things that have been defined are, are probably pretty reasonable that you, you might think of um, when you start building something. So you know, some of the examples of that would be a, a data path ID, which would be example. Uh, pretty similar to uh, the VXLAN VNI uh, and used for partitioning the network. And then it also has a, a, uh, an ingress port and egress port for how the, the packet is flowing as it goes through the network. So again, you know, I think that, that makes you know, sense as far as things that would be useful to have in, in general. But you know, it's kind of interesting to think about how you might actually use these in practice. And so one example of that is, say, a simple ACL. 
say I, I want to, to write a rule that says um, you know, port A cannot talk to port B, where those two ports are not resident on the same hypervisor. It, it seems like a, a simple and reasonable thing to do. But if you actually sit down and, and try to figure out where you might implement that, um, you could start on the, the source hypervisor. And that's, that, you know, that seems easy. Um, but then you realize that if you have multiple ports on the destination, you have a bit of a problem. Because unless you want to send multiple copies of, of, each pa uh, of the packet to each destination remote port, then uh, you, you can't do any filtering uh, on just one of those ports. Uh, on the other hand, if you, if you do filtering, um, or sorry, sorry, if you, if you uh, send multiple copies, that, that works out fine, but it's perhaps not the, the most efficient way to do it, uh, especially for the vast majority of traffic that probably doesn't have this type of ACL. So the, the alternative is to do this on the destination hypervisor, but that doesn't work so well either. You don't have the problem of filtering the packets, but you actually don't have the information that you need to do that. So you know, if you're trying to say, uh, did it come from this logical input port, without additional metadata, you don't know whether it's coming from that port or not. All you know is the hypervisor that it originated from uh, through the source IP address, but not the specific logical port. So I think once you're kind of at that point in the design process, Probably the, the fairly natural thing to do is add a uh, source port identifier to, along with a packet, and then you can very easily and cleanly implement this on the destination hypervisor. So you know, I think that, that probably works out pretty well. But then you know, if you kind of continue this thought experiment one step further, you might say, well, wait a second. People have been doing this type of ACL for a long time. In fact, they've been doing it even before network virtualization existed. You know, why, why do you need something new? How did they manage to do it? And so you know, a pretty common implementation of this might be something like a, a private VLAN. So for example, in your hotel, you could have two guests, and you want them uh, both to be able to talk to the upstream router to get to the internet. But you don't want to talk to each other because you don't know anything about the other guest, and they might be malicious or untrusted, uh, or you just don't want to see the extraneous traffic. So you know, how do they implement this? Well, you know, traditionally, the, the way that it's done is you'd have multiple VLAN tags uh, that are actually encoded on the wire for each actual uh, you know, concept of a, a private VLAN. And so that, that's fine. But if you think about what that's actually doing, that, that means you've basically borrowed a bit from the, the VLAN tag. If you've divided one VLAN in, into, say, a, a, a private uh, VLAN, another into a promiscuous, that, that's just one bit's worth of information. And so, so that, that seems OK, and certainly it works. But if you then translate this back into the context of, say, a VNI, you know, you've used one bit for a relatively simple ACL, and now you, you, you know, they start to add up, um, and you, you relatively soon run out of a, a precious resource. So I think that that's you know, kind of a, a nice example of how you might end up using some of this information. And of course, I think it can be used more in the future as well. So one of the, the final pieces that I wanted to mention as a use case, I think it's something pretty cool. Um, and this is a little bit more future looking for things that could really take advantage of Genev's extensibility. And th this is something called uh, INT, or in-band network telemetry. And th this is a, a solution to a, a problem that people often complain about with network uh, overlays, which is that you lose visibility into the, the underlay network that the, the traffic is flowing through. I mean, you probably can tell that you know, traffic is either flowing between two endpoints or it's not. But you don't know what point the problem is. You can't do routing around hotspots or, or that kind of thing. And so INT is a framework to be able to collect some of that information by allowing you to annotate packets with some commands that request certain information, uh, such as a, a switch ID or buffer status be added. And this is all encoded in, into a packet using uh, Genève options, which is a pretty natural fit for, for a framework that's designed to be extensible in the future and whose members are themselves potentially uh, widely varying in the data type and how they're used. And so you, you can either put these onto a, the, the packets 
uh, as they flow through, so data packets, um, in order to say cu troubleshoot customer uh, problems that are reported using the actual traffic. You can insert probe packets on the network to proactively monitor and figure out how things are, are going. Um, and you can even do this in a, not for just diagnosing failures, but using it uh, as part of a control loop in your, your virtualization system. For example, if you detect congestion at a, a certain point in the network, you can alter some of the parameters that, that would cause the routing behavior um, to, to cause it to, to load balance a little bit more efficiently. So I think this is, is very cool, um, and it's something that I expect to see more of in the future. And, and like I said, I, I think it's a very nice example of, of how you could actually take advantage of some of the extensibility with Genev. So th that's it. That, that's the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, ho hopefully, you've kind of gotten a little bit more uh, idea of how you might use Genev and how it's useful in the future and, and where things are today. Thanks. I think that's to you. <laughs> I guess this is directed uh, a, a, a little more to me. Uh, so uh, our, our our main uh, our main encapsulation type uh, we we plan to be uh, uh, Geneve. Uh, currently, uh, to talk to uh, uh, to top of uh, rack switches, we we need to use VXLAN because. Uh, uh, the, the only uh, well-defined protocol uh, for doing that is, uh, is VXLAN at the moment. Uh, we, we might uh, um, add support for uh, other encapsulations if necessary. NSH is one possibility. Um, and we currently support SDT as well. So uh, let's thank our speaker again.